We're going to look now at the paraffin paradox, which is an activity that I use early in the school year when we begin to take a look at making observations and learning about doing good science work. Uh, first, what I'll do is to show you how we're going to construct the paraffin paradox block, and then we'll go through the actual use of that. We're going to start off with paraffin wax, which is used for canning or other types of things. You might want to be careful that when you purchase it, that you get the kind that's found in blocks, because now they do sell some that is in a pellet form, and that won't work for you. We'll take two blocks of paraffin, and I've taken and cut a piece of aluminum foil that's just slightly smaller than the block of paraffin. We're going to sandwich that piece of aluminum foil between the two blocks, make sure that the aluminum is smaller than the paraffin because we don't want any of those raw edges to stick out. Then we have a plate, a Teflon frying pan or whatever that you might have. And I'm just going to take and place this into the frying pan and place it in there for just a quick moment so that all we're going to do is to heat seal those edges. And this pan is quite hot. It might not have to be quite that hot. And so what we have now is the block, which has been heat sealed on all edges. And as you can see, it's, there's no aluminum foil showing around with that. So a very easy device to make, very cheap. You can use this as a demonstration. Or it's possible that you may be able to make enough of these that you could actually do this as an experiment with your class if you chose to. Then the way that I use this is to come into class and I tell the students that I have this unusual block that I have found and I would like for them to help and work with me to make some observations about this. And so they will begin to make observations like um, it's white and I'll say good, that's a, that's a good observation. Uh, some student might say something like it's opaque. And I'll stop and say, can you tell me what opaque is? That's a pretty big word, so let's see if we really understand everybody what the word opaque means. And we'll talk about whether light passes through it or not, or things of that type. They'll say things like, um, well, it's, it's got different colors. And I'll say, could you expound on different colors? And so we'll lead them on to think a little bit about that, and some of the students will finally say something like, well, it's, it's white on top and it's black on bottom. Okay, good. The students might say something like, it's, uh, it's wax. And I'll stop them at that point and I'll say, can we all agree that this indeed is wax? Is that a valid observation that we would make? Or would it be better to say something like, it looks waxy, as opposed to saying it's wax, which would be a specific chemical compound or material. So we talk a little bit about what a valid observation would be rather than an assumption. We continue to make observations about that. And they'll say something like, well, it's not very heavy, and I'll say, well, how do you know that? They say, well, you're holding it up there without breaking it into a sweat, and I'll, I'll thank them for, for my uh, commenting on my physical prowess here and all. But we continue to go through and talk about things like that. And then, after we've made a number of observations about this block, and, you know, it's rectangular and, you know, all of those types of things, then I ask them to make a prediction. This block, as we've talked about, is white on top, and it's black on bottom. What will happen if I flip this over 180 degrees? Make a prediction in your mind about what you think will happen when this block flips over 180 degrees. They make their prediction, they think about it, and then I say, all right, are you ready to see if your prediction is accurate? And of course they are, and so here we go. On the count of three, one, two, three. And so the white was on top before and the black was on bottom, and so we would predict that the white is on top again? Well, if we did a 180 on it, why wouldn't the black be on top? And then they start trying to make all kinds of guesses about what's going on. And I ask them, no, let's not make guesses. Instead, let's see if we can do some small experimentation that would perhaps help us to understand what's going on. So the things they want me to do, and I tell them that we can't do anything destructive to this because as far as I know, this may be the only one of these in the world. So we're not going to cut it apart. We're not going to break it. We're not going to do something physically destructive. We can only make external observations on this. And so at that point, they may something like, well, turn it to the side. So I'll turn it like this for them. And they make their observations. Is that what you want to see? Sure. Well, then turn it up on its edge. And so I'll turn it up on its edge, and they look at it from edge, and make sure that you get to show everybody what that looks like on edge. Then they'll say, well, 
you know, what, what else can we do to it that won't destroy it? I mean, what else could we do? And I'll say, well, I just happen to have a flashlight here. Is there something you would like me to do with the flashlight? And so they say, oh yeah, turn it back like you started with. Great. Now, shine the light on it. And I'll say, shine the light how? Let's be very specific about what we're talking about here. Well, I can shine the light from the top. And we see that. Then they say, okay, we want to see the light shining up from the bottom. Okay, so we'll shine the light up from the bottom. And then what happens with that? Then they'll say things like, we'll shine the light from the side. Good, we'll shine the light from the side. And everybody gets to see it from the side. Then they want to do it on edge. Good, we'll do it up on edge. Well, what about on edge like this? Okay, we can do that too. And we continue to just walk through and look at the different types of ways that we can align and orient this. Well, what about if we shine it down from the top on edge? Good, we can do that too. And then after we've gone through all of these various uh, experiments, then we begin to say something about, okay, you have seen this. We've talked about it. You've had me do some little mini experiments on it. Now tell me what you think is going on in here. Now I want you to do what is called a hypothesis. Use all of the knowledge that you've gained and all of the data that we've collected here and see if you can come up with some ideas about what you think is taking place. Generally, the room goes pretty silent at that point because nobody wants to step out and look foolish. Encourage the students... This is a hypothesis. That doesn't mean that it's right. It just means that this is something that could be reasonable. You know, so students want to know, well, is, it, um, is, is, is there an interface in there like the air between the two blocks? Because they didn't see it constructed, of course. That all they saw was the block to start with. Is there some kind of air interface in there? And the air has a different index of refraction, and they start pulling out big words that maybe they've heard somewhere down in physical science or whatever. And I say, well, certainly that's a possibility. And then they'll say, well, there's something in between. Good. What do you think is in between? Well, that stumps them for a moment. They're not quite sure. They say, well, a piece of plastic. Or there's something solid. Good. Well, the block itself is solid. Can we become more specific than that? So you try to work them through this process of making observations and then taking those observations and the little experiments that we've done and come into a hypothesis process. Ultimately, somebody will say, well, it's probably like a piece of mylar, you know, like maybe those balloons that you have. And we go through that, and sometimes people will say it's a piece of aluminum foil. And I don't say yes or no at that point. I just let everybody make their hypothesis so that we've got all of these different versions that the students can think about. And then finally, at the end of the class, I'll tell them kind of what's going on. Or sometimes I'll actually wait until the next day, because if you're doing this several periods during the day, you don't necessarily want the secret getting out so that third period knows what first period did kind of thing. You have all fought that battle before. But this would be an easy process. And then when we're finished, I just simply tell the students, we've worked a scientific method. That's essentially what scientists do. They see something that interests them. They then begin to collect some ideas about it, and they collect data. They might do a little bit of experimentation with that. And then out of that process, they come up with something that they think is a reasonable explanation for what's taking place. So a very easy way to dig in into that, uh, I don't know about you, but I really don't care to teach the scientific method as though it were some holy process. There are many different scientific methods. There are just methodical ways of learning and getting to know knowledge. And that's all we're trying to get students to do is to look at this, think about it methodically and scientifically, make observations that are verifiable by others without making hypotheses and assumptions too early in the process. And then after that's finished, then we go through that and we're able to get our hypotheses and finish it up. This is a simple little process. Again, uh, I use it early in my class and it's something that the students think about from time to time. And during the course of the year, we might, they might begin to get out of the mode of making good observations that are verifiable. And I'll go back and say, remember the paraffin block? You know, we had to be sure that everybody was making the same kinds of comments and that they were all verifiable. So a demonstration that you could use, or if you had students you could trust, it would be very easy to make a variety of these, and you could have them out and the students could observe them and walk with them on their own and work through that process. So that's the paraffin paradox. I hope you enjoyed that.